Welcome back to the channel. Recently, The Atlantic magazine ran a long article about a doctor, and it was about a doctor who feels as if he experienced a vaccine side effect. The article is entitled, Did a Famous Doctor's COVID Shot Make His Cancer Worse? And it's in The Atlantic magazine, a legacy media publication. Now, the article describes the case of Michael Goldman, who is a Belgian scientist who had underlying lymphoma and that lymphoma was moving along at a certain pace. He received a booster vaccination and he feels as if after that booster, the cancer's growth rate accelerated and it really sped up. And this article talks about that. Now, the article is written just fine. It appropriately caveats that we don't know that the vaccine caused the acceleration versus was associated with the acceleration, et cetera, et cetera. But that's not my, that's not what brings me uh, a great interest in this article. I want to talk about all the things this article means because I think it means so many more things than this one little anecdote. And if you'll allow me, I'm going to walk you through some of the double standards that have been present in the legacy media. So first, I got to say, did the vaccine accelerate his cancer or not? I don't know the answer to that question. Nobody knows the answer to that question, okay? There are many people with lymphoma, and all of a sudden it feels like the cancer has picked up tempo, and we can't attribute it to anything, and it's also possible that it was a vaccine adverse event. And if you really asked me, put a gun to my head, and said, prove to me one or the other, how would I go about doing it? I would go about doing it in the most straightforward way I know how, which is to do a little bit of research. I would collect a set of charts which have CT scans for maybe 500 people with follicular lymphoma, for instance, and I would plot the growth rate prior to the booster and the growth rate after the booster and see if there's a jump. And I would need some negative control, some way to make sure I wasn't chasing noise. And what I would do is I would use the patient's birth date or a randomly selected date, not the date of the booster, to see if the growth rate changed around that date. And if the growth rate changes around both dates, the booster and the random date, then, you know, it's not causal. If the growth rate just changes around the booster, but not the random date or not the birth date, now you've prima facie got a bit of a case. I would do this study before I report it in the Atlantic magazine, okay? That's just me. I like to basically do basic epidemiologic work before I report it in a magazine read by millions of people. But what's interesting to me is, no matter what you think about the plausibility of the mRNA vaccine and accelerating cancer growth, some people think it might be plausible, some people think it's less plausible, whatever you think about it, there's one thing on this planet that you know for sure is more plausibly linked, and that is myocarditis in young men. Myocarditis, inflammation of the heart, has been proven over and over and over to be linked to mRNA vaccine. It has a age gradient. It's much more likely to be present in, young, in younger people between the ages of 12 and 40, and it has a gender disparity. It's much more likely to be present in men. And we know that in the peak demographic groups, we're talking about a risk of one in three to 5K. And for the booster from a paper by Katie Scharf, we're talking about the risk of myocarditis one in 10K. Myocarditis, a proven side effect of mRNA vaccines, proven, it's linked to it, okay? How many profiles can you think of in the New York Times, The Atlantic, Harper's Magazine, CNN, that feature a young man who is in the prime of their life, walking around, one day they get that booster, then they get myocarditis, and they suffer from it. They have crushing substernal chest pain, they get hospitalized, maybe even taken to the intensive care unit. At least one in the recent Lancet paper received ECMO, which is not a walk in the park. Some of them have prolonged late gadolinium enhancement abnormalities on MR many weeks later. Many have are on cardiac medications weeks later per the Lancet paper. Some are still told by their doctor not to exercise. There might be someone out there, a young man who had a athletic scholarship. Now he's reconsidering after myocarditis. Where is that story in the media? Now this story of the doctor, that's in the Atlantic magazine. Do I know that cancer lymphoma, tumor growth can be accelerated by murder. I don't know that to be true. And yet the Atlantic magazine think that that's appropriate to cover in their outlet, in their forum. Whereas the boy who's had myocarditis, where I know it's true, I know it's causally linked. There is no anecdote. There is no front page story about that. Think about the boy out there. If you covered that story properly in the Atlantic Magazine, the New York Times, colleges right now, like Tufts University, which is mandating the bivalent booster that only has animal data to support it prior to the last couple of weeks. It was brought to market only with animal data. That college might have tempered its recommendation to mandate that if we had featured what the human story, the human cost of myocarditis is, but the legacy media doesn't cover that. The next point, I'm gonna come back to this point, but the next point, they wouldn't have covered this story if he was an electrician, if he was a plumber, 
if he was a guy who was working in a factory, if he was working in a factory, he's not a doctor whose cancer might have accelerated because of mRNA vaccine, but we don't know. Atlantic feature story, did a famous doctor's cancer, COVID shot make his cancer worse? He wouldn't be that. It would be, this is an anti-vax electrician. This is an anti-vax plumber. This is somebody who doesn't understand science. They would speak very demeaningly about this person, and they would certainly not feature it in a national media outlet. So what does it say about the media that based on the prestige of the person who feels it was causal in their own body. They're happy to cover it. But the person who feels it was causal, but they're just an everyday Joe, they're not going to cover that in the Atlantic magazine. I think that's really something we have to reflect on. I think it's despicable. I think it's very likely true because I've never seen any story about a about plumber and all the things that he or she may have felt were due to the vaccine. I've never seen that story, but I see this story. Okay, a few more points. What about Johnson & Johnson? Johnson & Johnson and uh, AstraZeneca, the adenoviral vector vaccines, are proven to be linked to vaccine-induced thrombocytopenia and thrombosis, VIT. And that can lead to, lead to runaway platelet activation. There are some young women in this country who have been severely brain damaged by cerebral venous thrombosis after VIT. I've never read in the New York Times or the Atlantic Magazine a profile of how someone's life could be ruined after that adverse event. They feel that that's not worth covering, that that would encourage vaccine hesitancy. They do not cover that story. Why are they covering this story? I don't know that this is actually linked. I do know VIT is linked, okay? The next point. One of the things this person says is that we ought to have better surveillance systems in place because our surveillance systems are antiquated. I've been saying that for many months on this channel. They're passive, they're antiquated. But here's the question. What's the point of having better surveillance and finding out more safety signals if you don't act upon the safety signals you've already found? What have we done about myocarditis in young men? Here's what we could have done. We could have done randomized control trials of lower doses to see if a lower dose can have the same efficacy with less toxicity. We didn't do that. We could have actually completed a survey of children and young men who've gotten the vaccine to see asymptomatic troponemia, troponin leaks. You know who did that? Thailand did that. I talked about that on this channel. We didn't do that yet in the United States. It's a post-marketing commitment that's still pending. We didn't do that in the United States. What about spacing the doses? The CDC ultimately did that, but only after a year delay. What about omitting doses? Does a boy who's had and recovered from BA5 actually need the new bivalent booster? Do they need a booster if they just had Omicron? We did no such studies. So we have a real safety signal we've known about since the better part of 2021, and we have not acted upon it in any way, shape, or form. There has been, the only thing is the CDC ultimately after one year allowed to spread the doses just a little bit, I think to eight weeks, not to 16 weeks or more. That's all they did. So if you're not gonna act upon a safety signal in a very low risk population, young men, then what's the point of finding a safety signal in a cancer B cell deplete lymphoma population? Are you gonna act upon it? So, I mean, this person's point is well taken. I agree with him. We need better surveillance systems, but what's the point of having a better surveillance system if the people in charge have currently proven they are inept and incapable of acting upon a proven safety signal? That to me is deeply concerning. I think this story is very interesting in another way, which is that the risk-benefit balance shifts as you get older, more vulnerable, as you've underlying comorbidities. As you get more frail, more vulnerable, have lymphoma, are older, the risk-benefit balance of a COVID-19 shot changes. If anything, you have more to gain and you have less to lose because you're older, you're vulnerable, you have a potentially huge benefit, even from the nth dose. Whereas, think about the younger person. The younger person, the absolute risks are so much lower. They're so much lower. That 20-year-old man who's already had three doses and had Omicron, that person is now being recommended by the CDC and in some places mandated to get a booster. What's the potential upside? The maximal upside is much smaller than for an older person, frailer person. And the downside is potentially more salient because even a rare event can tip that balance. And yet, The Atlantic Magazine is not covering the young person saga. They're covering an older doctor, wealthy, well-connected doctor who has cancer. If anything, the person in whom that even in the setting of uncertainty, you might be most willing to give it a chance. This runs counter to the basic principles of evidence-based medicine, which is you need better data for younger, healthier populations. And you are more willing to tolerate uncertainty in someone very, very sick. The entire impetus for the right to try bill, which I have issues with that I've discussed um, elsewhere, I think in some commentaries many years ago, 
But that impetus is that people who are sick and vulnerable and dying should be given greater flexibility in choosing the risks they're willing to accept. Whereas healthy people, if anything, they need to be more shielded because it's much easier to do something damaging to a healthy person. Yet here we see the principles completely put on its head, put on its head. The White House has put pressure on the FDA leading to the resignations of Gruber and Krauss from the US Food and Drug Administration. I found that deeply problematic. They didn't resign under Donald Trump, they resigned under Joe Biden. We need to remember that. Who was the White House that put the pressure till they resigned? It wasn't the last guy, it was this guy. Now those people are gone and now we have the White House with Ashish Jha as COVID czar. We have Walensky, we got Morthy, we got all these people working hand in glove with Albert Borla to decide when the next booster is coming and to create, Peter Marx has written about a, you know, a yearly booster, a perpetual booster campaign, level of evidence, I just said so, because he's not done any randomized control trials to show that that's necessary. And we have people like Paul Offit who are vocally and passionately disagreeing. To the credit of Paul Offit, a good man, a good person, and somebody who has integrity. So we've got people disagreeing with this policy and the White House is pushing it through. And where is the legacy media coverage of this? The legacy media is ignoring this entirely, giving them carte blanche to do whatever they want. Meanwhile, why are they covering this famous doctor? And so I want to be clear, the Atlantic news coverage of this doctor was fair and balanced in my opinion. It didn't sensationalize, it was accurate. But that's not the point. The mere act of covering this doctor's anecdote elevates it in the mind of the reader such that they believe it has great salience. And even that, I still don't quibble with, but what I wonder is, why would you elevate an anecdote that remains unproven, gray, uncertain, while not covering anecdotes that are proven, documented, and linked? These are solidly linked. Myocarditis is solidly linked, and it has a human story to it. It has a human cost. And if you covered those anecdotes, these colleges, these mid-level bureaucrats, they would not have the same power to mandate booster after booster. Their power would be stripped because the American public would see that the person who's suffering is really suffering. And who is a mid-level bureaucrat at Tufts or Smith College, somebody who doesn't know any better? Who is that person to decide that you ought to do it? And also in violation of all basic principles of ethics because there's no proof that it actually makes other people safer. And it's an individual health benefit at best, but there's not even proof of that in the case of the Bible because you have to run a human trial to get some evidence. Who is this person to decide? A prerequisite to mandates is there is a benefit to third parties. That's not present in this case. So what am I to think here? This is a very interesting scenario. Michael Goldman, I wish him the best. And I, I, you know, for his own sake, I hope it wasn't the vaccine that stimulated his cancer to grow. Is it possible? I, maybe, but I would want to do some careful studies. They're not hard to do, by the way. I mean, you could go to an emergent, you could go to an electronic health record and answer this within two week period of time. Anyone out there, if you have an omnibus IRB that's already written, meaning you have permission that you could look at individual patient data, many people do, especially for lymphoma, they have an omnibus CLL IRB or an omnibus FLIR, follicular lymphoma IRB, they have that. If you have that, all you do, you take all the scans, you blind them, you give them to the radiologists, you have them come up with resist measurements, you score the tumor size, you calculate a growth coefficient pre-vaccine, post-vaccine, and a growth coefficient pre-birthday, post-birthday, and you ask the question, is the growth coefficient changing more around the vaccine than it is changing around the birthday? The birthday is a negative control. That's all you have to do. It can be done in two weeks. Why is no one doing that study? That's a separate issue. I mean, I think they might do that study after the Atlantic article because it brought a lot of hype to it. But why does the Atlantic not wait for that study? The myocarditis, you know how many of those studies we have? We must have 50 or 100 different studies in different data sets proving that this is a link, and yet they refuse to cover the human cost of it, the human story. So that's my big issue. They have a double standard a rich doctor, an old doctor who thinks it might be related, oh, that we can cover. But an electrician, a plumber, a regular Joe, and even a boy who's been, who's, it's proven that it's linked. They won't cover that. Well, that will actually encourage the wrong behavior and we can't have that. And that to me is very bizarre and is a failure of the American media. The media and politicians it's good when they actually don't agree because the media serves as a check on the political forces. And with the last guy, that was the case. And I actually thought the media, you know, sometimes they may have been, uh, uh, you know, there are errors of all kinds. They go too soft, they go too hard, but at least there is some check and balance. But if the media is going hand in glove with the administration, as it appears increasingly to be the case currently, then you don't get that counterbalance. You don't get that pushback. And the legacy media, why are they not covering the fact that, you know, there are many doctors who think that eight mice is not a suitable standard for authorizing a booster. And also another paradox, which is one week 
we say we're going to use emergency use authorization powers, emergency powers to grant a booster based on data that would normally not pass the, the standard biological licensing agreement pathway. That's one week. Two weeks later, the president's on 60 Minutes saying, hey, COVID over. COVID's over, buddy. So which is it? Is it such an emergency that you have to use EUA authorization? HHS has to consolidate emergency powers as they're doing? Or is it over? In which case you can give up the EUA authorization and you can file the formal pathway BLA. A perpetual booster campaign will make a lot of people rich. But whether it makes anyone healthier is uncertain. And that's what Paul Offit is saying. And vaccine side effects are to be vetted carefully, scrutinized carefully, and only discussed in the media forum if they have cleared those filters, in my opinion. I, I mean, anyone can say that anything happened to them after anything in the past from, you know, people will attribute anything to having had COVID or gotten the vaccine, or some people attribute anything to having eaten a cupcake. You can attribute anything in your life to what happened before. But the purpose of epidemiology is to separate which of those are true and which of those are coincidence. This is still in the unknown area. And what I really struggle with is why they're covering something in the unknown area when they refuse to come cover something in the proven to be linked area, okay? That's my issue. I want them to explore more side effects, sure. But before, but, but not before, but while they're doing that, I want them to act upon side effects they've already found. I want them to run randomized trials of lower versus this dose of boosters in young men and look at antibody le levels and look at severe disease levels. I want them to run randomized trials of spacing the doses. I want them to say that in the absence of those randomized trials, we're not going to mandate this. We're going to suggest you have some flexibility. And I want them to say what evidence, if any, they have to support boosters in somebody who hadn't recovered from this virus because they certainly don't have randomized data. And antibody data is a crude surrogate and crude surrogates don't always track with a hard endpoint. That's been, you know, much of our research agenda for many years. So what are my thoughts here? This is a double standard. The Atlantic magazine, more than happy to say, did a famous doctor's COVID shot make his cancer worse? But they refuse to say, did this poor vulnerable college kid get myocarditis because of a stupid booster requirement made by a mid-level bureaucrat who has no business practicing medicine? They refuse to cover that story. And that's why they are failing the American people. They're not holding power accountable. And that's why, you know, we have to turn to alternative media sources. I mean, we have to look, I mean, that's why, that's why I mean, I listen to a lot of different podcasts that are done by independent media groups because this is a big failure. So those are my thoughts on this off the cuff. If you like this, read the article I've written about this in Sensible Medicine. That's a Substack I, that I'm a part of. Many people are a part of that. I also have my own Substack, Benai Prasad's Observations and Thoughts. You can like, subscribe, comment, leave a message below. You can follow me on Twitter and uh, uh, you can listen to the VPZD podcast or plenary session, which is mostly about oncology clinical trials. And uh, I guess I'm disappointed. You know, I'd like to see news coverage of things that are proven and show the human side of that before we start covering things that are speculative. Seems like that's pretty obvious, but until next time.